Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Vonna Pfeiffer. You're listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for the needlework artist. I'm, I'm going to keep going with that, uh, that needlework artist thing. <laughs> I like that. It sounds sophisticated. Yeah, it's, it's it got does. A, yeah, it's got a thing to it. I'm going with that. Mm-hmm. And our <laughs> guest this week, Barbara Kershaw. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Gary. Sorry, I forgot. That's and okay. This is all very new to me, so excuse me. Quite all right. Quite all right. My my wife forgets too, so don't worry about it. <laughs> oh well, that's normal. Yeah. So so we get to talk this week about white work. Oh boy, pulled thread, white work, uh, all kinds of things with Barbara. This is going to be great. Looking forward to this. Uh, and this time we are sponsored by the Attic Needle Workshop in Mesa, Arizona. So thanks to Gene Lee and the folks there at the Attic Shop. Now, some things going on. This is, we're recording on the uh, 4th of September. The new newsletter just came out the 2nd. The best thing to do, as we said the last time that uh, uh, the the Attic sponsored us, is get on the list for the newsletter. Because Mm -hmm. they they have a lot of events, but they sell out fast. And mm-hmm. if you want in on them, get the newsletter. And Gene always puts up, if you get on the list, Gene always puts up that the new newsletter will be posted this evening or tomorrow or something. So there's always advance warning. And then uh, you get that thing and go through it if you want to do an event at the attic because you have to be quick. They sell out in a hurry. Uh, so it's And the newsletter is the way to find out. And plus, getting that newsletter is, you know, it's 20 minutes of just, enjoyment looking at all the yeah the beautiful pictures and the oh yeah i like it just for that yeah it's like a magazine really it it is i mean it's a it's a it's a work of art it's eye candy it's inspiring it's all kinds of good things cost great photography yep yes that thing costs vana like a hundred bucks every time it comes out yeah at least every time Zero willpower. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> uh, I all know that. Embroiderers know that feeling. <laughs> yes. So we have uh, a couple things to mention out of here. The sampler of the month is May Health and Peace Attend Your Days by Milady's Needle. This is a Vana size sampler. It is. Yeah, 251 by 232 stitch count. So on 40 count. Linen is 12 and a half by 11 and a half. So that's, yeah, Vana, you can actually do that. I could. And it's beautiful because I thought I watched, I looked at the, I get the newsletter and I looked at it and it's a beautiful sampler. You ordered it, didn't you? Um, I, I have got it on my, hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> my, hmm, I'm thinking about it. Liz. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, yeah. See, this is the trouble. Yeah. Um, so it's the sampler of the month. So you get, if you buy two parts of the kit, you get a 15% discount. So the chart is 20 bucks. The, uh, a very swat, a silk swat gel J is 72 and swa 100 slash three is 52 80. And then the linen depends on what you buy. So if you buy two of the three of those, you get a 15% discount on that, which I don't need to tell you, Vonna, because you already know that. So I already um, know about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can do you can do that. Um, then uh, this is sampler September month, so you receive a 15% discount on purchase of all sampler designs, charts, and kits. Weeks Mocha linen. Was it Stitcher Quarter or Stitcher Halves? Right. SQs mm-hmm. and SHs. 40 yep. count, 46, and 56 count. 56, that's Vana count. I, was, I, I saw that in the, in the newsletter, and I thought, 56 count? Oh. You can't count it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to take a blind stab at that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, also the 15% uh, on the solid, all solid silks, the Verisua and Needle, what is that? NPI, whatever that stands yeah. for. Needle. Needle point. Uh, Ink. Incorporate. Yeah. Incorporated. Yeah. So uh, 15% off that. So sampler September is uh, some big savings. So kit up for the winter is basically what that is. Yep. Uh, And then I did not know this. And Gene posted this in the um, in the newsletter from a, a repeat from 2017 that they have. The attic has a hats hands across the sea samplers 
Chart Collectors Club. Mm-hmm. You probably knew this, Vonna, because you're, you're a charter member. But um. Well, no, I'm not. I wish that I would have thought about joining it, though, when that uh, – what are those two uh, sister charts? What are those? The Isabella. Isabella. Yeah, Lufendels. I could have had those, yep. but anyway, Automatic, whatever. Yep. So I'm if you if you uh, give Jean a credit card, she has to have a credit card on file, and you have to give 30 days notice if you're going to cancel. Uh, if you give that to them so they have a card on file, you'll get a 10% discount from each hat's release and a discount, 10% discount on your supplies for the sampler. Mm. So, so money saved. And you also, but, but yeah, uh, as in the F. Ufendel uh, thing is a prime example, you would automatically get the new release. So, uh, and Nicola just released. Four, three, two? I thought two. two. Maybe I'm wrong. Two. Yeah, she just released two charts, so you would have those already in your hot little hands if you were a member of the Hats Chart Collectors Club. So call the shop there at uh, the attic and get in on that. Yep. Bonus. The ladies are very nice. This will help you so much. Sometimes you're lucky and get to talk to Jane. Yeah. A lovely like, lady. <laughs> yes, lovely lady. That I tell you, the attic is on my uh, bucket list. One day I'm going to go to the attic. I hope. I've been. Oh, you're I lucky, was lo Barbara. Yes, I was. I was lucky enough to get into one of her sampler symposiums too. Oh, had a wonderful time. Gary's like a rock star there at the old attic. He gets to go a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've been there a few <laughs> times, a handful anyway. Yeah, yeah, they do great events, don't they, Barbara? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The weekend I went to was uh, Lorraine Moots from Germany was there. Um, and I would had met her before anyway, and uh, so I had to go and stay the weekend with them and had a wonderful time. I love that. Um, had to go and stay the weekend, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a long way for me. <laughs> way, way to tough it out, Barbara. <laughs> uh, yep. So there we have it. There we have it. Things to do at the attic, uh, things to buy, and thanks to Gene and the folks there at the attic for sponsoring us. And, yeah, call them up. They'll ship you stuff everywhere. If, uh, yep. But, yeah, yeah, you go to the shop. If you're anywhere near Phoenix, find your way to that shop. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, Barbara. Okay. White work. Now, see, white work. I have a special affinity for white work. There's something about white thread on white fabric and what you can do with it that just fascinates and intrigues me to no end. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's to just when, when you can do that without any color, it's just so neat. So how, how is it that you got, got yourself so sucked into white work? <laughs> Actually, I just sort of uh, wandered into it, if you like. I, I, I suddenly realized one day that Every time I looked at a display of needlework or a book of needlework or a, an exhibition or whatever, I always gravitated to the white, the white on white. And it's just been a passion ever since. I started with cross stitch and I started um, doing a, a sampler because that's, well, those were the first books I ever I got to teach myself to do this. And... Uh, but I, I just sort of wandered into the white work, and, and it's been a passion ever since. So, so the standard cross-stitch uh, path for you then? Yes, yes. Yeah. I was never I, – I mean, I did uh, – I was at school in England, obviously, when I was little. I was born in England. And um, we did cross-stitch and Lazy Daisy Stitch in junior school. Uh, but apart from that, until I was about 40 or so, I, I had not done any more embroidery. I did mm -hmm. used to make my own clothes, but I didn't, uh, I hadn't done any embroidery till then. Until you were 40? Yeah. Oh, my word. And your work is just absolutely stunning. Well, that gives me hope then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, I, found, I found something that was absolutely enthralling. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, it's wonderful. I just, I get so passionate about it. Yeah. Well, it's clear, it's clear in your work that you're more than passionate about it. Yes. Uh, 
So, so you have, so you have this massive gap in your life then where you're doing no needlework or something else. Oh, just, uh, I'm, 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 well, I had children, so I was bringing up there children. There we go. Okay. And, got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Yeah. It was my son actually that got me into cross stitch because he totaled my car and I had no transportation. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I wasn't, I wasn't going to sit and watch television, you know, those awful soap operas. <laughs> so I had to find something to do. <laughs> That's it's interesting to me that it. So when you were a, a girl in school, you got exposed to that. So you're one of those examples where you get exposed to needlework and may not do it for a long while, but it's still there. And so when the yes. opportunity comes up, it, it you take advantage of it. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. See, I that's... mean, I don't know. I can't remember doing much of it at school, although it was interesting. I was home in England on holiday a few years ago. My cousin, uh, I had gone for her 80th birthday, and she brought out a tray cloth that I was her bridesmaid when I was 10. And I had made this tray cloth for her when I was 10. And it was Aww. fascinating to see. I mean, it was threadbare because <laughs> she'd used it so much, and it was a treasure. And I, had, I don't remember doing it, Aww. but it was fantastic to see it. Oh, that had to feel good. <laughs> oh, it did. It, it felt wonderful. And to, the fact that it was appreciated mm -hmm. and used. Yeah, well, yeah, we've had discussions about that, giving uh, needlework as gifts and how many times it's just not appreciated. So that's that's the extra extra little something there. Yes, yes. Um, oh, I'm very careful these days who I give it to because, <laughs> you know, it's not going in a drawer somewhere. If they don't want it, they don't need to have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, so true, yeah. Yeah, and that happens a lot with, uh, with needlework, I'm sure. Well, there's stories all the time about, I gave this away, and you know, so one uh, that was a while ago. Uh, they were cleaning out a garage, and there was something that she'd give as a gift in a bottom of a box that had gotten wet, and uh, you know, that that <laughs> hurts. A, yeah, or as a friend of mine says, she gave a, a, a cruel pillow to her, her daughter-in-law, and when she went out to Calgary to see the daughter-in-law, the dog was lying on it. Oh. It, was a it was a dog's cushion. Oh. Oh, she was most upset. <laughs> oh, oh, that, oh, that cuts deep. That's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think I have, I have just a general policy. Uh, they're not gifts unless it's to somebody who truly knows what goes into them. Um, yes, yeah. yes. Because most people can't appreciate. Yep. Yeah. So, so the the white work. So this the white work path was really you just had an affinity you just you just kept gravitating toward that it wasn't anybody who turned you on to it or some special event you just kept migrating I just, toward the yeah i yeah i just gravitated um when i first joined a when i found a guild in 1992 i found a guild locally and I, I was able to join. And, of course, I, I owned a new cross-stitch up at that point. And these ladies, I mean, to go to this guild was just absolutely fascinating because I didn't know all the different types of embroidery that there were. Mm. So to see all this was just mind-boggling. <laughs> and uh, they were going to do this correspondence course with the uh, Embroiderers Association of Canada, and um, I decided I would do this white thing. And uh, it was hard on her. And I loved it. I just loved it. And from then I went to my first American sem uh, seminar in San Francisco. And again, I did this white thing. And it was a, a sampler of Schwarm embroidery with Donna Strader. And I have to tell you, I was in love for the minute I sat down. <laughs> that embroidery just came off my fingers, <laughs> and and it was um, you know it was a journey that has been amazing. So, uh, I right, well, first let's I got to get this straight in my head. Help me understand, because because you have uh, we have pulled thread, we have Schwam, uh, Casa Guidi. Is that how we say it? Castle Guidi. Castle Guidi. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how the Italians pronounce it. It's an, an Italian white word. Yeah. 
uh, Italian drawn thread. Compa- how, how do these things fit against Hardanger? Because Hardanger is, is the one that I have at least some experience with. Are these all just variations? Are they uh, just because they came from different parts of the world? Are, are there distinct differences? Help me understand how this all fits. Well, um, needle um, needle lace became uh, popular. Lace made with needles became popular centuries ago, uh, when you had the sumptuary laws. Uh, you know, back way, way, way back. Uh, ordinary people weren't allowed to have lace. It was a, a very expensive commodity. It was a status symbol. And so the peasants, if you will, needed, wanted to create their own lace. So they made it with a needle. And they made their own fabric, obviously, and they the thread, what spun the thread. And then they started to pull threads in in, um, in in fabric and then they started to cut threads out and see what they could do with that and they created their own lace so it was their way of owning something beautiful and so um, you you get Hardanger is a lot of them are very interconnected um, the different techni- techniques would move across Europe or the world. And each, like Schwamm embroidery is very much like Italian drawn thread in places. It, Schwamm embroidery started out as flat work, which means that there was no cut work and there was no pulled thread on it. It was just surface embroidery. But then the Italian influence of Reticella came in and they started cutting threads. So... You know, all these different influences flowed across the world and became their own. Uh, and a, and a, a country or a, a region would pick it up as their own and adapt it as their own type of embroidery. So that helps me understand then, because when I look at Schwamm, it does have the, the majority of the stitching tends to be a surface. There's no cuts, there's no openings or anything. So that's its origin and then any cut uh, stitches or or areas then are part of that external influence then. Yes, yes, yes. You know. And, I mean, uh, German Schwamm is very much like Italian Assia. And certain Hedebo uh, has a a Schwamm. uh, With Hedebo, there's a lot of different periods there's about six stages of Hedebo and its development over the years. And one of those is old Hedebo, which actually is the newest form of Hedebo. That's where it... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's where the areas are cut out and needle lace stitches are put in the open area. Well, that's very much like Schwamm and Asia. The, the uh, border stitches are different. Like with um, the old Hedebo... Uh, the border is um, two rows of chain stitch. In Schwamm, it's uh, coral nuts and chain stitch. So the subtle differences, but they're very, very similar. So you could do you could do a chart then. You could take Europe and do a chart, and and show the or- origins of these things, but then really show the overlap and influence of these various techniques. I suppose you could, yes. Yeah. I've never tried it. I've never tried it. It'd be a fun. Yes. It'd be a fun thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. To see. Uh... It would take a lot of research to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and the neat thing is, is all of these things have survived today. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, the Italian, the drawn thread was what was basically done by the nuns, as tr- it was church embroidery. Mm. It was done for the churches and the cathedrals and, and you know, and the bishops and, and all these uh, dignitaries in the church. And so it was preserved by the nuns. And it's only lately that, um, you know, uh, there's not a lot of written about the old stuff either. Um, if you, um, what's her name? Oh, I can't remember. But there's a lady in California that has done a lot of research on Italian embroidery. 
and and she's she started to document it and it was the same with schwam embroidery that nothing was really written until just after the war if you go to schwamstadt ziegenheim which i've been twice and taken classes uh, in the museum there are binders in that museum that a lady called Thakla Gombert, actually when she went to the town and started admiring the embroidery and wanted to learn how to do it, she decided that because there was nothing written and nothing documented, she would write binders of the different stitches that were in Schwam, the different designs, the different borders, the different cutwork, and she's documented it all, or a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So she brought it back, if you like. And because there's now written stuff, then people can then take it from there. And, and uh, she promote, started to promote it again. Because originally it was a, a very much a peasant embroidery. So then um, any, any original uh, information has to come from actually actual stitched pieces, which I can't believe there's that many if it was a, a peasant level thing, probably wasn't much preserved then. Well, it's, it was, I, I would have thought that too, but when I was uh, taking classes in the museum, it was amazing how much embroidery was still, uh, coverlets and, and bedspreads and, and pillowcases that were available from the 1700s. And, but when you listen and you hear about it, the embroidery, uh, in, years ago in, in the peasant, they would live in very small premises, and their bed would be in the living room. So the bed would be in the corner of the room, and so if you had visitors, the bed would be dressed. Oh. So it would be dressed with a, a, a beautiful um, bedspread and pillowcases, and when the visitor got, visitors are gone, they then took it off and put it away. So it wasn't laundered every week and uh -huh. disintegrated for that. And because it was for show, really, a lot of it, then uh, it survived. Hmm. And so you can look at it, and it's absolutely fascinating to look at. Hmm. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, so the bed was the showpiece of the house because it was so small. Yes, yeah. and then, of course the windows as well with right. the curtains and, and stuff like that. But these are wonderful, wonderful. And the bedspreads were interesting as well that the, the embroidery was only across uh, the top and down one side because that would be what would be seen. Yeah. The other side would be against the wall or tucked underneath the foot of the bed. <laughs> so it, it, was, it's, it was fascinating. Yeah. So if we see a, a design, a bedspread design, where it's only on one side, all right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Why do the side that, that the wall is going to see? Yes. <laughs> that's right. That would be the side that was seen. Ah. <laughs> all right. It's fun. It's fun. Well, yeah, it is. See, then, and that's I just so that's why I so enjoy doing these podcasts. Learn something every time, every time. So this, um, so what? What white work was it that you really started to get serious? Was it Schwam? Uh, yes, definitely. When I went to that seminar and I learned this thing that I had no idea what it was, I couldn't. I don't <laughs> even know whether I pronounce it, pronounce it right even now. But uh, yes, yeah, she inspired me, and it just seemed to. It just seemed to to be. You know, it just seemed. It came almost naturally. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was, Donna was very, very encouraging. And, um, and she told us in the class about having gone to Germany herself and taking classes. And that was then my goal was to, so I was lucky in 2005 that I, a friend, a friend from Montreal and myself, we went to Germany for two weeks and stayed in, in, in a hotel in the town and uh, went to classes in the museum. Mm. And it was just wonderful, even though we couldn't speak a word of German. <laughs> yeah, you don't need that. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that! what a great environment to learn in, too. That had oh, to be fantastic. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. So then, so, yeah. so the, the Schwamm, is that, is that where you started your first design? Was your first designs uh, basically Schwamm white work? 
Yes, because it, and it was some, that was again something that you know I didn't know there was no conscious decision to teach this, or to uh, to design it, but it was a case of you know you you go somewhere and somebody would say oh wow you did that you learned that will you show me, and then somebody else would say oh well come to the guild and show our guild because they'd love to see it. So, and that's how, basically, how it started. It was a case of, well, I've got to do a little piece so that these people can do it over the weekend. Yeah. And, you know, and my first, my first teaching job happened to be in Ottawa, which is about four hours from me in uh, Ontario. And um, it was a wonderful weekend. And I just took all my pieces that I'd done for myself and... Uh, and that was where I started my, really started uh, to teach. And, uh, and I, got, I got, my, got my ideas at the time from old books I, and old pictures of old, and, and from, you know, eventually, once I'd been to the museum, um, taken a lot of photographs, that was my inspiration, was all this old embroidery. So I basically teach the, the traditional stuff. Um, I don't teach a modern version of it. I don't mind what you do with it, but I will teach you how it used to be. Mm -hmm. And you can take it further, you know, if you want. Yeah, well, that's because to me, that's always a question with designers of these old world techniques is do you stay pure and true to the original or do you vary from that and you know some people will add color there's all kinds of, of ways to go so so your orientation is to stay as true as possible to the yeah, original techniques. Yeah I'm more techniques. of a traditionalist yes I'm okay. more of a tradi traditionalist my tongue's around my teeth here. Yeah let, yeah yeah you say that I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I I I try and stay I'm I'm not um uh fanatical about being traditional but um i do try i i, I think it's 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 good to, if you've never learned this thing before that you learn the traditional way and then you do with it what you want mm -hmm. yeah and i and i like the the traditional yeah having that foundation yes yes yeah yeah so then then white on white for you is the way to go and you don't uh, vary much from that? Oh, I, I, yeah, my other passion is 17th century English band samples. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so when I go to Guild and I've got something colored, everybody looks at me in amazement. <laughs> and say, my God, Barbara, you've got color in that. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> But yes, I love I love band samplers. Oh, that's not a bad not a bad place to be. No. Yes. Yes. Band samplers. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah, there's some amazing stuff there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they have white work in them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Vaughn and I are working on a, a the Queen sampler uh, right now that is has a white work at the bottom. We're going to get some experience with that and uh, mm -hmm. some Fabulous new stuff. Yeah, some new. Uh... I'm actually, yeah. Have you heard about the uh, course that Tricia uh, Wilson Wynn is uh, running at the moment? It's um, uh, an, a 17th century uh, white work. And so I've enrolled in that. Oh. And uh, it's fascinating, too. Yeah, I have her on the hook. If she ever gets home from her travels, I have her on the hook to do a show. <laughs> she's, a, yeah. she's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, she's a great lady. Yeah. What's that one you're doing, Vana, that you started, the uh, white work? It is the 17th Century English Band Sampler by the Needles Praise. Okay, I don't know that one. Oh, yeah. oh wait a minute. Yes, I do. Yes, by Darlene Osteen. Yeah. Yes, I have that pattern upstairs. <laughs> yep, I started it. I got, let me see, three bands done. <laughs> oh, good for you. It's a beautiful one. I, I, so I was teaching in Newfoundland um, in the fall, last fall. And one of the ladies brought it into class that she just finished it. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And the pictures don't do it justice at all. They no. can be on online. And no. um, I I am just all new to all of all of this, to be honest with you. And um, I mean I've cross stitched for close to thirty five years, but 
I never dipped my toe into anything at all until what? When Gary six weeks or not six weeks ago, three months ago. I don't know. It is just in my, and it's like a fever. It's like, yeah, honest honest to heaven. It's like a fever burning in my soul that I have to do all this other stuff. And, and when I go back to try to do cross stitch and I, and people have questioned me this, you know, since I said this on fiber talk a few weeks ago, I have to like think about how to do a normal cross stitch because I've been doing, you know, reversible cross stitch, Montenegrin stitch, all you know. All this I stuff. know it's wonderful, then, isn't it? And, yes, and when you go back to just do a regular cross stitch, it's like, how do I do that? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm thinking every time about you know how to do something else. So yes, no, I am thoroughly enraptured with the whole thing, and I agree with you. 17th century band samplers are just absolutely gorgeous. Oh. Yes, yes, the colors and, and, I mean, I'm very bad at color. Um, I can appreciate color. Uh, if you gave me, well, anybody gives me a pattern and you've already chosen the colors, I'm fine with that. You give me, a, I mean, I, I years ago took the uh, a, a 17th century English fan sampler course through EGA. And it was 18 months of learning about, um, you know, the different bands and, and band samplers. And it was a fabulous course, but one of the first lessons you had to do was um, you had to choose the colors that you were going to put in this sampler. Now, I don't know a lot about color, I, and, and quite frankly, it, it frightens me. Mm-hmm. And it's strange to say, but I can remember going... I love you, Barbara. I love you. Why? <laughs> I struggle with I, color, too. Oh. You know, I went to, my friend and I belonged to the Sampler Guild in Buffalo, and we both were doing this course, and we'd gone down to Buffalo for the day, and she said, we have to go and choose our colors, so off we went to the local, you know, uh, embroidery shop, and Caroline was just in heaven, sitting on the floor with a box of our ferris wheel between her legs, and she was pulling out colors, and, and all of a sudden, she looked to me, and she says, what is the matter? I said, Caroline, I have to get out of here. I feel sick. Mm-hmm. I actually literally felt sick looking at all this color and mm. having to choose from it. And I went and sat in the car. I said, you can take as long as you like. And she was just in heaven. And so eventually, little bit by little bit, I chose the colors for the sampler. Um, but I didn't like doing it. And it was a very strange reaction to all this color. Hmm. And it sounds weird. It sounds weird. And it's not that I don't like color. As I say, if you give it to me, I will use it and love it. But don't ask me to choose to put those colors together because I, I, I can't. Mm-hmm. Well, you got it worse than I do. I feel a little <laughs> better now. <laughs> Because I really do. I struggle with it. And I even I've sat down many times just to study and see if I could get a handle on things. And it just doesn't come to me. And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I have a standard male red green color blindness. So that doesn't help at all. But mm-hmm. it, I, I just struggle with it in general. And and so to hear you say that makes me feel a lot better because I uh, with this red green color blindness, it's always been kind of a. Uh, oddball thing anyway through life and then when it comes to these kinds of things like I'll tend toward toward blues blues and whites and that kind of thing because that's easy for me to understand and put together but uh, you know some of these others you know somebody else helped me out yeah I even took her through EGA I took a, a color course a long time ago to try and get over this but you know the if the whole thing was torture I mean, you got first. You got your first lesson, and I got my black and my white paint, and I'd ordered all these color papers that you had to have. And uh, um, the first in the first lesson, it said make a fourteen point gray scale. So I thought my friends and I decided this would be easy. We'd get white paint, we'd get black paint, and we'd you were, we'd mix it in in sort of increments to see which you know get lighter and lighter or darker and darker. So I'm in my kitchen with all this black newspaper and black and white paint and and, and paper to put it on, 
And I ended up in tears because it wasn't working. And I sat down at my dining room table and thought, I can't even start this damn course. I can't <laughs> even make black and white paint, you know. And so here I am, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, Barbara, for goodness sake, you know. And then I looked at this pad it's, of paper. It's black, it's black and white. Oh. If they put a yellow in here, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so I looked at this pad of paper and it said, uh, 19 point grayscale, every shade of, of paper from black to white and, you know, 19 shades of gray in between. So I thought, oh, well, I could just choose 14 of these and stick them on something. <laughs> and there I am. So I went from there, but the whole thing was torture. And every time <laughs> I'd, I'd start to read a book on color and the theory, I'd fall asleep and, oh, it was just torture. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I go I go white work too. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now I do like tone on tone too. It doesn't it doesn't have to be white. I do like tone on tone. Oh, okay, okay, that's that's <laughs> that's when you really go crazy then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, years ago, some I was I I created um a, a kimono, a pole thread kimono, and somebody said to me, "Well, why don't you do one in color?" And it was for a class, for a, a national seminar here in Canada. And so I did the white. Well, it was cream, actually, cream on cream. And I thought, well, I'll do one in Confederate gray. I love that Confederate gray. I think it's a fabulous color. So I did one in that. And, and I offered both at the seminar. Do you know out of 25 people, only two took the color? Oh, that's interesting. Which I, I found very, very interesting because I thought, well, why did I bother? <laughs> <laughs> All that work, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, white on white, but, yeah, you take any, really, any color. I mean, there's there's a lot you can do with, with just that tone on tone and, and mm -hmm. get some real uh, uh, impact with the same design. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. I am fascinated by, I have not until we got ready for this one, this show, Italian drawn thread, the Italian uh, white work. Tell, okay. help, help me with that because it, there's a, an elegance to that that I don't think we see elsewhere, do we? Um, well, I, in normal drawn thread too, the div, I, I, I differentiate between Italian drawn thread and drawn thread in that the Italians often do it from the back. They work from the back and the front is very neat. So, well, so is the back, but um, so a lot of, and that's, and that's what makes it different is the fact that these stitches are actually worked from the back. And uh, I mean, the pee hole stitch, which is one of the basics, uh, pee hole hem stitch, you also get in Schwamm embroidery. The difference is, and you could feel the difference because the knot on the uh, bundles that uh, you're knotting bundles together, the knot in the German Schwamm is on the front and on the Italian, it's on the back. Mm. So um, the reason I sort of picked up doing the Italian drawn thread was because it's that different. It's not different to look at. It's different in the way it's done. And it's, it's neat for people to learn a different method of doing something. So you, so you literally flip it over to stitch it then? Yes, with with 50% of it. Not all of it. Mm -hmm. Some of the, obviously, some of it's done on the front, but quite a lot of the stitches are actually done on the back. Hmm. That's interesting. Huh. So that's why I call it Italian white, uh, Italian drawn thread. Yeah, yeah. Now, Otherwise, it, it would be just drawn thread. Mm -hmm. But a couple of your designs, your Italian designs, there just seem to be extra. Oh, I wish I could find it to give you a, a design, but there was just some extra uh, elegance to it. Uh, oh, yeah, like the, a, this Amelia one. Now, that's Italian, right? Yes. All those towels are Italian. Okay. Um, they have some absolutely amazing patterns in their drawn thread. Um, it's very intricate and very uh, detailed and uh, absolutely just 
mind-boggling, some of them. Yeah, because it, it's not, uh, it, they're not designs or stitches or whatever that you call them that you see elsewhere. No, no. They're just very, uh, very elaborate, some of them. Some of them are very simple, but a lot of them are very elaborate. And the wider they get, the more uh, the bands get, uh, the more elaborate they are. And it takes a lot of passes, if you like, to do, um, uh, you know, it might have all the little knots on the bundles are called knotting. And sometimes it's done straight across the band. Sometimes it's done in in curves. And, um, and there's different methods of doing the curves even. You know, you can sort of go from top... Um, the top of the bundles right down to the bottom uh, and you cross in the middle. But if you go from top to the middle, you'll get uh, crosses in the, in the, in between the bundles. It's hard to describe, but yeah. so depending on how you actually run the knotting stitches, which is the basis for doing all the very intricate needle weaving on these bands uh, creates a pattern as well. And my my limited exposure to Hardanger, I I did not find once I got past the cutting part, which is is a huge mental hurdle for most people. It was for me. After that, doing those stitches, th though they look intricate and difficult, they're they're really not. Can does that apply almost a, across the white work uh, realm, where yes. once you do them, th there really isn't that much difficulty to them. There isn't a lot, well, with some of that uh, intricate knotting, it is difficult, but your tension is your most, uh, really the most, most difficult to control because that determines how uh, neat and how spaced everything is. So control of your tension is, is critical in, in a lot of that drawn thread. Yeah, okay. But, but to execute these once you've done a few, yeah, is, is really it's, it's, it's not that bad, no. Yeah, I mean, I even found hard on her at times to just get to the point of boredom, because you know, well, it's very soothing. Yeah, and yeah, you can, you can do it. Yeah. Okay, put a positive spin on it. Go ahead, fine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, you're doing the satin stitch block, the clusters. I yes. mean, it is. It's just satin stitch, you know, and depending on the direction you're going, and it's very mindless. Yes. The knotting in the drawn thread is mindless. You really have to concentrate on what you're doing. Mm, okay. All right. That's where that's where we go to the next level then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I shouldn't use boring because it is re <laughs> <laughs> it really is really well, soothing. No, like some people, you might get bored with it. Some people find it soothing. Yeah. You know? I enjoy doing it, and I so I, I shouldn't say boring because I really enjoy doing it. But just just wrapping and those kinds of things. Yeah. It's it's pretty mindless stuff. And yeah. it just it just goes on and on and on and and yeah once you've done a couple it's uh, pretty straightforward you know yeah when you do this do you do your designs do you tend to just use the same ground cloth for all of this uh um, well, a lot of my designs are done for classes uh, for teaching, so yes, I tend to stick to twenty eight to uh, 32 is usually, um, people get afraid of higher numbers, you know, 36 and, and 40. Um, you, you can do Schwann beautifully on 40 count linen, but people, you, people see that number and, and they're so afraid of it, mm -hmm. that it's too fine and they'll never see it. That's untrue in that, particularly with Schwann, most of it is surface work. So the only counting you're doing is when you're cutting in order to do the ground stitch, you know, the, the filling stitches. But once you've cut the threads away and created your grid, you've got a very big grid to work on, even at 40 count, and it's not hard to see. So people get afraid of um, the, the, the higher count linens because they think they won't see it. And with the Italian drawn thread, for instance, they often used very fine count, 50, 60 count linen, exquisite linen, but they didn't count it. They measured it. Oh. And a lot of it was done by eye. You know, they didn't count the four-sided stitch. They 
just measured the distance in their mind. So if you actually photograph some of this old stuff very, very close, it's not counted properly because they didn't count it. Hmm. Just to done we, it we, enough, we, they can eyeball it. Yes. And, and we tend to get very um, particular about, oh, it's got to be over four threads or, you know, uh, mm. and yet years ago they didn't worry about it. Well, there, everybody, lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> but see, for me, well, you know, that, that sounds like a, a freeing statement, but then you want everything to look uniform or very close to it. So in a way, you almost have to pay more attention, I would think. Oh, maybe you do. Yeah. But, I mean, even if you buy uh, some Italian books now, the, the printing now, uh, with the drawn thread in, you will you will you won't see a count. You'll see uh, six centimeters. You oh, know, okay. cut cut threads to six centimeters. Often with the the linens that they're using, especially when you get the higher counts, they're not even weave. Mm. Right. So if you count thirty threads on the wall, it won't be the same with the thirty crowns, uh, thirty threads on the weft. Uh -huh. But six centimeters will be. Uh. Okay. Right? So, so you almost don't have a choice there in that instance. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's why sometimes, you know, if you're doing a four-sided stitch on an even weave linen, that it looks like a rectangle because the at the different count. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. I noticed this on, this doesn't have anything to do with white work, but, or anything, but on the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. The, I know, right? On the queen stitch that Gary and I are doing, which is a needles praise um, chart as well. Um, I'm on the Montenegrin stitch band and you do Montenegrin stitch. Then you do uh, the next row on it is um, double back stitch. And um, on the double back stitch, so this Montenegrin band is that you do is kind of an undulating diagonal, horizontal, you know, diagonal band. And yeah. then the double back stitch, you have to compensate for the diagonal. And so you're actually working. And I, and I did it over and over and over and over on my doodle cloth. And it's like, this is not right. This isn't right. You know, I couldn't figure out how it was. And finally, it was like, quit counting threads because I think that was the problem when you go on the diagonal. Because yes. you, you have to get it, you know, butted right up next to the row of Montenegrin. And when you're doing the Montenegrin, you have to compensate, compensate the stitch when you're going diagonal. So it's really kind of over three, three threads. And on one of my arms, it looks bigger because one of the threads that I'm stitching over is like one of those thicker linen threads yeah. than what, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it has bothered me and I'm worried that I'm not right on my counts, but I've looked and I've looked and I've looked and I, I believe I am right. So I think it's all in my head that I understand what you're saying by six centimeters because I've, I've witnessed that on this band that we're working on it's like oh my word this is driving me bonkers and i've worked on it five nights and i'm not very far <laughs> because i've done it over and ripped it out and done it again and ripped it out but i'm finally come to the conclusion that i'm right and that it's just that's the way it's going to be and yes yes you know and you can't so. and you can't it's the nature of the linen you, yeah you you can't uh get rid of that fat thread Right, no, and I, and right. that's what I've just come to believe is that you know that's what I came to think last night. This isn't my fault. I'm doing everything that I think is correct, and it's just this linen. And so. and it, and it doesn't need to be what we think of as perfect. Right. You have and that to it, go. You have to go with the linen. And right. if the linen's and, not perfect, then the embroidery won't be perfect. Right. And I think that that is one of the hardest things in my step outside of just counted work in general is a step outside of cross stitch is that I have to like be a little bit flexible. That's what I've learned with this queen stitch because we're stitching it reversibly, Barbara, as well. So yeah. you have to think about how that thread's lying on the front and on the back. That's and, right. 
And then, you know, you break a lot of rules, <laughs> you know, in cross stitch, you break a lot of rules because your legs aren't going the same way. And it's all because you're trying to get it to look the same on the front and the back. And that is what I've learned is to just like throw the win rules out the window and just enjoy and learn and try to do the best you can, you know, the best I can be, because I think that I try to be a perfectionist and I'm not going to be a perfectionist on my very first drive through the outside and, and you also, yeah you also have to take into account that when you're standing back from the whole thing you will not see that fat thread yes exactly right yeah you will see right. the beauty of the whole thing mm -hmm. you won't see that one little fat thread that's really <laughs> annoying you at the moment <laughs> that's right you're exactly you know. right yeah that's yeah. so true i i catch myself because those fat threads drive me nuts as as do the thin ones <laughs> uh, you know, same yes. same thing and and you really do have to forget or realize or remember that you're working under a magnifier or working up very close and that when you step back none of that matters no that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i've just uh, created a piece for next year's uh, canadian seminar and um it has a uh, buttonhole stitch the the whole it's a needlework pouch and the pouch is surrounded with um, buttonhole stitch. And so the flat on this pouch is uh, on the diagonal. And uh, so with that, the buttonhole stitch was over four threads everywhere else, but on the diagonal, it can only be over three mm -hmm. to get the same look, the same depth of the stitch. It had to be smaller because on the diagonal, it's a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you do have to well i have to because right? i like it like you I, I like it to be as neat as possible <laughs> what what kinds of when, when you're teaching what kind what are some of the major questions or challenges that your students run into what what pops up every time i think tension really okay. oh yeah tension um, and, and particularly in pull thread, uh, people are afraid to pull and you can pull very tight. Um, so you're, but an even tension too is, is very important to, to the overall look of it. So I think that's one of, I mean, I do get people afraid, mind you, my classes tend to, people aren't as afraid of cutting threads as they used to be. Although I had one student one time and we were doing it was in the guild and I was doing a pilot class for one of my pieces and you had to, it was a drawn thread piece and you had to cut 40 threads, leave 50, cut 40, leave 50, right? Mm -hmm. So this lady happens to be, <laughs> she tends not to read and she's uh -oh. always in a hurry. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> And so she phoned me and I had said to her, now, you, you really need to take this slowly. I often say cut one thread at a time. You, even though you're cutting 50, if you cut one wrong, you've only cut one wrong. You've not cut 50 wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. So she phoned me and she said, guess what? You cut the wrong threads. I've cut 50 wrong. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I said, well, we have to redesign your piece then. <laughs> so, but I learned that a, a while ago, a few years ago, we did uh, 16 of us in my guild did a tablecloth, a Schwamm tablecloth, and it had borders and it's a losing Happel. Uh, have you heard of her? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, it was one of her, and we, and of course, this was years ago when our books were always in, or only in German. So she had done um, a book on fancy borders, hems and borders. And so we all decided we were going to do these tablecloths. And everyone is different, and everyone made mistakes, cutting mistakes, including me. And uh, so we all had to, and I learned then that. You can usually redesign your mistake. You can adapt it. You can work with it, and um, you know you can fix it. Mm -hmm. Is that that's so? That's usually the best out if you miscut is to change your design a little bit. Change your design or fix it. It depends on the the, the seriousness of it. Uh, but yes, when <laughs> 50 I fifty threads uh, would be serious. I would fifty say. threads, yes. <laughs> 
She either gets a new piece of fabric or she redesigns the piece. <laughs> There's not much else she can do. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of threads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think mine had gone you know? right in the trash. I'd have just started over. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, uh, but it was a tablecloth that taught a lot of us not to worry about making mistakes. Uh -huh. Because there was always some, there is always something you can do to to either redesign or readjust or fix it. Oh man, fifty threads! I'd just cry. Oh, <laughs> uh, and I knew I just knew it. She was going to do it. I knew she was going to do it because she just in a hurry again. Were you, Diana? Oh uh -huh. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oops. Oh well. Oh, but. And I don't know whether she ever finished it. She never admitted it. So she probably put it in the trash too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to regain your enthusiasm after something like that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, but my. the tablecloth became such fun because, you know, you're going to go two weeks later and people would look and say, okay, so what mistakes did you make this week? <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> yeah. oh, uh, that band wasn't supposed to be that wide. I know. Well, I had to adjust it. I had to recreate a new one, you know. <laughs> so it was fun and it taught me a lot. It taught me not to be so anal. To be to be more flexible and to mm. and to not worry about the mistakes that you made. There's always something you can do. Yeah, I agree with that because I've learned. I'm learning that too. I mean, I'm by no means an expert at it, but I'm learning that you got to roll with it and it's still okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you change the pattern and it becomes yours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm interested, Barbara, in like for a new person that's just dipping their toe in white work or what is your suggestion? Where do you where do people go to look, you know, to learn or to, you know, a lot of people don't have opportunities in their areas to take, you know, classes or um, talk to people about it. Is there a certain pattern or a book that you would suggest people to get started on? Hmm. I don't really know. Um, and it would depend, because white work is such a very, it, it's really a generic term for anything white on white. Mm -hmm. With so many, I think there's hundreds of different techniques within, under that umbrella. That, um, I mean, I have an old, old book of the pull, pull thread, which I think is my Bible. In fact, I have to buy another one because it's falling apart. And that's mm -hmm. Moira McNeil's pole thread embroidery mm. and it's a wonderful little book it's a dover publication and and it gives you all the basics of learning the stitches in pole thread and and that's you know, what my my when i you know gary kind of introduced me to white work because he just loves it and thinks it's very elegant and he taught you know he's the one that even I mean, I guess I've seen it, and, you know, but I never did pay attention to it until Gary said something. And so when I was researching, like, oh, I've got to do that. I've got, you know, I looked at pictures and stuff. And you're right. There isn't very much out information out there. And um, so that's why I just bought a pattern and was like, okay, I'm jumping in. <laughs> and, so, and I mean, and so in, in what you've said here today, that's kind of the same thing that you did yourself then is just kind of just jump in then. Well, that's right. And I was, as I say, with, with the Schwamm, I was lucky to take uh, a couple of classes with Donna Strader. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what introduced, because, I mean, literally, I was looking through the catalog for the seminar, and my friend uh, from Ontario was going with me. I mean, we, this was a big adventure in 1996, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to go all the way to San Francisco and to a thing we'd never been to, and we had no idea where we were going or what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so... She had picked out her first two choices, and I picked out mine. She And we got together and said, well, which do you want to take? And here we got the very same thing. She got this acorn sampler from Gayon Rogers, and I got this acorn sampler from Gayon <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> and we both got this white thing. And she wasn't but I said, well, it seems silly to me to go all that way to both take the same class. If you take one and I take the other... We can come home, and I'll teach you what I learn, and you can teach me what you learn. Uh -huh. And so, but she wasn't budging from the acorn sample. I thought, oh, darn. 
you know. <laughs> and so, well, okay, I'll take this white thing. Well, I was in seventh heaven. Uh-huh. And she struggled with hers because she she likes linen. And, of course, Gay Ann likes Congress cloth or mm-hmm. canvas. And <laughs> so she struggled and I was in seventh heaven. <laughs> 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 and then when we came home, you know, I, I did the acorn sampler on linen. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Why not? And she, yeah. <laughs> and she never did finish the uh, the schwam. So yeah. it was just it was meant to be. I'm sure it was meant to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was just that was just jumping in and doing this white thing. Mm-hmm. It's amazing um, how uh, people get. It's amazing the paths that people follow or <laughs> they get dragged along. And yeah, then, and then you get to a point where it's what you do and you love. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. yes, and it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, it is. You're right because I don't have very high self esteem, and just to know that I in. I'll be honest with you. When Gary was like, oh, let's do this, let's do this, and I was like, mm, this isn't going to be. And I have been really, really scared about it. And I have gotten such a great feeling of sa- self-satisfaction because I'm doing this myself. You know, I'm teaching myself. Every time we do a new band, I'm learning something new. And I, ha- I mean, you're right. It's just a great feeling of self-satisfaction. Oh, it that, is. It is. Yeah. And if you ever need any help, you know, you can always contact me. I'm more than willing to to help as much as I can. Well, thank you. I, I, I love that. I love to show people how to do it, and when they get as excited as I do, it's a wonderful feeling. But and you it, shared something, yeah, and they like it too. And that you're perpetuating future generations. Yes. So no, that's what I. That is my true, true. What my fervor or what my aspiration is is that any kind of excitement or what I have about needlework that I'm exciting somebody else about needlework, whatever that might be. And then they excite somebody else and it just keeps on going and yes. going and going. Yeah. And we're fortunate to live, you know, as you spoke earlier about the peasants and that they did it and, you know, nobody wrote anything down and, you know, there's, you're right. There's not that much to find because I've looked, you know, <laughs> I really have looked yeah. and um, you know, it's just, you know, it's kind of by word of mouth and we're very fortunate to live in a time and era where connections are possible to be made all over the world, you know, from the comfort and privacy of your own home and to learn and to grow. And so I just feel very fortunate that I live now and that perhaps I can inspire somebody. I mean, you are definitely inspiring to me. I looked at your, what Gary sent to all your work and what fantastic body of work you have and it's just gore it's just gorgeous absolutely gorgeous and it's inspiring thank you thank you i love to do it i just i do i really do love to do it and i love to share it with people too mm-hmm. it's uh, you know i get as much satisfaction out of a class most times as <laughs> uh, as the people in the class <laughs> yeah because, yeah you know i just right. do yeah right um, and I've met some wonderful people. Yes. You know, I've met people that are, 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 are wonderful friends. And, I've, I, you know, I've been to Australia and I've been to Bermuda and, 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 and a lot, I've taught a lot in America and as well as Canada. And it's just a wonderful, a wonderful sharing. And, and as I say, the friendships you make are just, you know, invaluable. Right. And it's almost like connection since you share a love of handwork and you meet that person, it's almost like a connection of the heart. You immediately get them and they get you. And it's a very special thing. And it's, you know, you don't find that on a day-to-day basis with just people that you pass on the street, you know, and it's, I found yes. that myself. Yeah. So. And I'm very, very, very uh, shy. And I used to be very, very shy. I mean, at one point I would never walk into a room on my own. So for me to travel as much as I've traveled and learn to be with people as much as I have, and it's all due to, to embroidery and the encouragement of other ladies mm-hmm. that do this. Mm-hmm. You know, they have taught me a lot, and in, in turn, I will teach other people as much as I know. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, because I'm so grateful that they shared with me. Right, um, exactly. Right. Yeah, um, I mean that's exactly how I, I feel. It's, it, sometimes it sounds cheesy, but it's not. Mm-mm, it really no. isn't. 
No. And it's not even about monetary compensation to me, you know, and I, and that's why I, you know, I finish a lot of, um, of work and that's why I give away, you know, I, I share tutorials and stuff like that freely because it's not, to me, it's not about monetary compensation. What the compensation to me is, is that I've inspired or, you know, through whatever I've done, somebody else to go out and create because that's what gives me joy in my life is my hobby. And if I didn't have needlework in my life, and I'm certain you feel the same way because your life is wrapped up in needlework too, who would I be if I didn't have needlework? And yeah, I just am very passionate about it. And it's always a pleasure to talk to people such as yourself who are passionate in the same way that I am. And it's just, you know, inspires me to be, you know, grow and learn more and more and more. Yeah. We got to stop. Oh, it's been lovely to talk to you. I didn't know how this would go because, as I say, I used to be very well. I'm not. I'm not as bad as I was, but I used to be very, very shy. And uh, I've grown a lot since doing all this, and uh, so I didn't know how this would go at all. But it's it's been it's been fun. It's it been, has yeah. been. Yeah. Yep. I don't know that it's done you any good. <laughs> <laughs> Told you much, oh yeah, you no. I'm uh, everybody listening to this has uh, uh, learned something. I guarantee you that. Oh, I absolutely. Guarantee you. Yep. Well, All right. So tell, and now, of course, we have. Tell everybody not to be afraid of it. Yes. Exactly. Don't be afraid of it. No. Yeah. And of course, we have more questions. So that means Barbara, you go on the short list for a return visit. <laughs> Well, thank you. That's nice to yeah. hear. No, you're you're on the you're automatically on the list because there's more questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks to everybody for listening, and remember, if you buy something you shouldn't, hashtag Fiber Talk made me buy it gets you off the hook. All right. Thanks okay. for listening. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.